Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Laz Vekiridis. I'm the Principal Product Manager for the Storage Gateway team. Uh, and I'm here with Ed Laura, who is our Solution Architect for the Storage Gateway team. And uh, we have a great presentation for you today on uh, how you can accelerate your uh, performance and adoption of Amazon FSx for Windows File Server with the AWS Storage Gateway. So, uh, as you probably already know, files are everywhere these days. Uh, this is a sort of an endemic problem with uh, all on-premises infrastructure. Uh, you have user shares, you have content repositories, uh, you have uh, media processing, uh, engineering files, and uh, of course you have group file shares where you have security policies and access controls that are very fine-grained across groups. Uh, all of these create uh, a lot of headaches uh, in infrastructure uh, that needs to be maintained. Um, you're probably faced with some of these challenges. Uh, first of all, you have the uh, ever-growing infrastructure. Uh, these file workloads are growing constantly. Uh, so you're hitting storage and compute capacity limits. Uh, you have to take this hardware and refresh it every two to three years. Uh, and so uh, warranties expire or you have to re uh, re renew your warranties. Uh, you probably also are dealing with data protection issues. Uh, these file shares tend to be very vulnerable to malware and viruses. So you have to have infrastructure to uh, give you fast recovery in case you have an infection. Uh, you also have to deal with uh, the, the site resiliency problem where you may lose data that you're keeping on site. So you have to have disaster recovery infrastructure uh, and, of course, off-site backups. So there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into having these group file shares. Enter Amazon FSx for Windows File uh, Server. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a fully managed, highly reliable, uh, scalable SMB uh, storage system built on top of Windows Server. Uh, it's ideal for home directories, content management, uh, virtual desktops, pretty much anything uh, from uh, Windows and Linux applications where uh, you need to access uh, files over the SMB protocol. It's fully managed. Uh, it's built on top of uh, an actual Windows Server implementation. Uh, so uh, you don't have to uh, actually manage any hardware or infrastructure, uh, and it has full feature parity with your, your on-premises NAS infrastructure. Uh, you're, you have lots of flexible options for uh, selecting the appropriate performance or expanding that performance as needed. So we have options for SSD or HCD. Uh, in uh, the uh, case of the uh, resiliency, uh, we have uh, single AZ and multi AZ implementation. So you can simply uh, flip a switch and you can have uh, multi availability zone uh, synchronous replication for two, two of these instances. Uh, you can scale throughput and storage independently of one another, depending on how many clients you have. Uh, and you also can take advantage of optimization through data deduplication and compression. It's a very, very easy uh, migration to go to uh, the, uh, the cloud-based service. We actually have uh, a service called uh, AWS DataSync, which will allow you to transfer all of your files and all of the security metadata to uh, the Windows platform running in the cloud. You don't need to re-platform or re-architect. And all of this integrates with your existing infrastructure, including DFS and Active Directory. Of course, uh, you probably want to access this from on-premises. Uh, this infrastructure is on-premises. A lot of our customers have told us that they want uh, on-premises access to FSx for Windows File Server. Uh, uh, for latency and performance sensitive applications, uh, they want something that uh, actually takes care of some of the latency and performance deficiencies. They want to be able to provide file services to multiple locations without having multiple servers in each of those locations. Uh, and retire uh, these legacy file servers, uh, and they want to be able to centralize data protection and security in a single location. Uh, you also uh, surely want to reduce your physical NAS infrastructure on premises, uh, and you want to improve the amount of bandwidth uh, that you use. Uh, bandwidth being, a, in, in many cases, a very limited or expensive resource. Uh, enter Amazon FSx File Gateway. Uh, this is uh, an ability uh, service that allows you to uh, extend FSx for Windows File Server into your uh, on-premises data center and your remote locations. 
Uh, it's deployed as a VM or as a standalone hardware appliance or even an EC2 if you wanted to go cross region. Uh, it's a local cache of recently used files that you know help to improve performance uh, and reduce latency on the user I/O side. Uh, and then on the back end, uh, there's a lot of uh, network optimization so that you can minimize the amount of connectivity you need in order to access the cloud infrastructure. Uh, you get a centrally managed console uh, from you know a single pane of glass. You can pretty much manage all of your gateways, uh, and uh, you have uh, a fully uh, integrated solution uh, from this. Um, you know, the architecture looks something like this, uh, where you have the uh, FSX file gateway component on premises uh, connecting to uh, the SMB clients, uh, be they Windows desktops or, or any other type of system that requires SMB access. Uh, connectivity from the gateway to your local region uh, is either through an AWS site to site VPN uh, or an uh, AWS Direct Connect. Uh, and uh, you uh, connect right into your VPC from uh, both of these uh, connectivity options where you get the access to all of your file systems. So a single gateway can actually connect to multiple uh, file systems, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, there's a storage gateway endpoint, uh, and then, of course, uh, there's the Amazon FSx for Windows file server uh, behind all of that. So you can have multiple instances behind uh, FSx for Windows file server, so lots of file systems. And you also have uh, the management uh, endpoint, which is the standard storage gateway endpoint. You can uh, have up to 64 terabytes of cache on premises and up to 500 active clients per gateway. Uh, you have the ability to set up uh, high availability uh, with integrated VMware HA support. Uh, and uh, you get uh, an on-premises cache uh, from the solution that takes that 80% of the data that you're usually accessing and brings it close to your users. So you get uh, an on-premises uh, user experience from cloud storage. So let's talk about how this works. Um, in, in the case of a write, uh, the way the gateway works is that your client will actually write the data to the local file gateway. The file gateway will actually acknowledge the write locally, so your clients can continue to go on from that. Uh, this is basically a local storage uh, performance level, so it's very low latency. And uh, the gateway will accumulate these writes, uh, and in the background, it will spool them out to the file system in the Amazon FSx for Windows file server. So uh, what we have here is a write back cache where your writes are acknowledged immediately uh, and data is sent asynchronously uh, to the back end. Uh, so uh, once something is written, uh, the gateway will hold on to that as sort of the most recently uh, accessed data. Uh, and uh, the cache will be managed using an LRU algorithm. So uh, as, uh, as the cache fills up, the least recently used data is the data that gets evicted. So we have two different scenarios for a, the life of a read. Uh, in the read path, uh, the most common scenario is when the data is actually serviced out of the cache. So uh, as mentioned before, we have a least recently used uh, cache algorithm. Uh, and with a properly sized gateway, uh, the preponderance of your reads will be served out of that uh, file gateway cache. So uh, the request goes into the gateway. Uh, gateway looks up for the data. It finds it in the local cache, returns it immediately. So essentially, you're getting the full ability of your local storage and your local networking. So it feels like a local file system, even though it actually is running out of the cloud. Uh, in the back end, you do have the ability to change files in the file system. Uh, there is a refresh algorithm. So every uh, five minutes or so, the file gateway can scan the back end cloud file system so that it can surface any new files that show up to your on premises users. In the case of a cache miss, uh, what the gateway does is it quickly realizes that the data that's being requested is not present in the local cache, and it will actually go over to the, uh, the cloud file system. It will retrieve the data that's being requested, and then it will actually write it to the local cache. So uh, you, you will get a, uh, a read 
across the, uh, the, the connectivity to the cloud, uh, you get a response. Uh, the data is deposited in the cache, and then the response goes back to the client. Uh, this is not the most common uh, scenario. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you calibrate this correctly, only a, a small percentage of your uh, reads are actually going to result in misses. So to show you how this works, uh, Ed has a very uh, interesting performance demo, uh, and uh, he's going to start it right now. Uh, you could actually see how well this arrangement works, uh, and Ed will uh, talk right through it. Ed? All right. Thanks, Lars. Yeah, so for our performance demo, we'll jump over to the lab environment, and let's take a look at what it a uh, gateway provides in terms of performance versus going directly uh, to the file system running in the cloud. Now, for this environment, right from the get-go here, I'm just going to create uh, a new file, um, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a bit. Um, we're going to create that file on the FSX file share. Um, so that's the FSX file gate. Uh, FSX file share in the cloud that we're going to create that file. Um, and, you know, to, to speak a little bit about what this environment is, um, we are running FSX file system in a cloud region in US East 2, Ohio. Uh, the share name is, is the FSX file share, the drive letter. We're, we're actually mapped from a Windows client in my on prem environment, which is a VMware environment um, in Boston, to the, the W drive, which is the file system in the cloud. And then I've also got that same share attached to um, a file gateway. So I'm running a local gateway in Boston in my VMware environment. And so I've got the same file share essentially mapped um, from a client that's on-prem to the on-prem gateway into the cloud file system. Um, you'll see, uh, you know, here we've got uh, a hidden file. So we are uh, passing through some attributes as well. Um, and, and what I've got, down the bottom right is uh, a time uh, a clock that we'll use to show uh, what it's like when we actually open up some files. Um, so this Windows client, just a Windows server running as a VM in my on-prem environment. Um, again, we're mapped to both the gateway and the cloud file system. And we've got some test files to use. Uh, in, in this case, we've got 100 records, uh, uh, 5 million records, and 1 million records. Um, you can see the sizes of these files as well. Um, but uh, so uh, a couple things here. Uh, we've, we've created the, the file in the cloud. And I know Laz spoke to the automated cache refresh uh, feature. So after about five minutes, that file is going to populate in the local gateway. Um, but one thing to note is that uh, the gateway itself, when we create files locally on it, you can almost see those files upload to the cloud immediately, right? So, you know, the first test, that first uh, file we created was in cloud, and it's going to use that automated cache refresh feature with Gateway. will do a refresh of its cache up to every five minutes, and those files that are created outside of the Gateway will populate. Um, but if we're creating files directly on the Gateway, we're aggressively pushing those files up to the cloud as fast as possible. Um, we want to make sure that that data is protected and we want to get it to the cloud um, as soon as we can. So that file populated in cloud almost immediately. Uh, and, and after we uh, wait a couple of minutes here and we'll do a refresh, we'll see that file uh, populate down from the cloud on the local gateway. So let's see what it looks like when we actually open up these files. Um, and again, these are just you know test dummy files with 100 records, uh, 1 million records, and 5 million records. So it goes from 13 kilobytes all the way up to uh, you know, 600, almost 610 megabytes. Um, and let's let's just see what that experience, that end user experience looks like here. So um, look, uh, loading it from the local gateway for a small file, 13 kilobytes, um, and from the cloud, not too much of a difference, right? Uh, so you know, some small file workloads, you're going to be able to pull that stuff down from the cloud, no problem. Um, and it's going to you know, work just as well on premises as well. But for you know, a bit of a larger file, so this is a 100 meg, 121 meg um, file. Let's just see how long it actually takes to open up this file. 
And this would be, you know, an end user experience opening maybe a PDF or something that's, uh, you know, image or maybe a CAD drawing or a large Excel spreadsheet. That took about 15 seconds. Um, from end user perspective, you know, maybe that's tolerable for your environment, but um, most likely, you know, maybe that's not. So let's just see what it's like from the local gateway. And you can see it's, you know, about, it was about two seconds. I was a little slow to hit the button there, but, um, you know, we're usually up to about 10 times faster opening these files. And just from an end user perspective, um, that's quite important, especially when you're implementing a new system and everybody knows you're implementing a new system because you're planning a cutover window. Um, and then all of a sudden, if the, the new system is slow, um, everybody's going to come back to you and say, hey, why did we implement this system? So uh, it, that local performance is really, really important to preserve. So here we're opening up the 5 million record file. Um, again, this is 609, almost 610 um, megabytes. And uh, the speed, you know, I've got a direct connect from Boston to Ohio. Uh, so this is kind of best case scenario from a networking perspective. I've got a 10 gig uh, direct connect from my local VMware environment on site in Boston to um, the cloud. And, you know, still opening up this file, 609 megabytes um, is going to take quite a bit of time. And again, you know, depending on what your use case is, uh, you know, oftentimes this is not necessarily acceptable performance. Um, users are now sitting here for, well, we're, we're close to a minute and they're trying to open this file. Um, at this point, you know, they've probably walked away to go grab a coffee or, or do something. So we'll give this a few more seconds while it loads. And it should uh, be wrapping up here. In a second. And there we go. Just over a minute and a half. So you can see as the files get larger and you know, again, these are just text files with some dummy data, but um, any type of workload that has larger images and you can think PDFs and, and Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoints, um, you know, Microsoft Office, Adobe Suite, uh, you know, other applications like CAD and CAM uh, applications that you've got these larger files, you know, that's really where the gateway uh, shines. And think of the gateway as an add-on service as well. You can always deploy a, a cloud file system uh, but, you know, you can always add on a gateway. If the performance isn't meeting your users' expectations, you can always go and deploy a VM, attach that file system to the gateway, and have your users moved over to connecting directly to that local gateway, and you'll get that, that local performance. And here, you know, it's a large file. It, did, it does take a little bit of time to open, but we, we just shaved off an entire minute of, of loading that file. Um, so from a application perspective, uh, this is going to be a lot more tolerable. Um, it's going to provide a, a much better end user experience. And, you know, ideally it's going to be uh, preventing tickets from coming into you after you've done a migration. Uh, here, I just hit the refresh so uh, we can see that, that that file that was uploaded to the file system in cloud, um, you know, we can get that every five minutes as well. The gateway does uh, use that automated cache refresh feature, which you can toggle on or off as, as you're creating your file shares and attaching your file shares, um, where it basically updates itself with what has changed in the cloud. Uh, so it'll do a, a scan against the, the cloud file system and make sure that it's reflecting the metadata for what is actually in, in this directory. And then as we you know go to open that file, it'll actually start to pull down the data. So it's very efficient. Um, gives you, again, that end user experience, hopefully, that you're looking for. So um, back to the gateway, and I uh, wanted to cover uh, another feature here that uh, a single gateway, you know, running as a virtual machine could run as a hardware appliance on premises. Uh, we do sell a, uh, a branded AWS hardware appliance, which is a 1U physical server that you can deploy as an FSx file gateway. Um, you know, so VM, hardware appliance, uh, could even run as an EC2 instance, say, in another region 
to provide local or, or closer access for your users. Um, if you've got a file system created in a, in a single region, say in US East 1, um, and you want to uh, have access from, say, maybe the West Coast of the US. Um, so the, the gateway itself can attach to multiple file systems. Um, an FSX file system can go be up to 64 terabytes of data. So oftentimes customers come to us and say, hey, I've got seven file servers on prem. Um, I'm going to migrate these to the cloud. Uh, how should I migrate these? And, and usually they, you know, we can provide an enhanced uh, performance in, in more granular uh, performance and data protection strategies if we split up those uh, workloads and in, in those files into multiple file systems in the cloud. Um, so similar to how you, you would do that on prem as well. Uh, so a single file gateway, though, can actually have multiple back end file systems that it it mounts. And we call it attached to the gateway. Um, and once it's attached to the gateway, these file systems are then shared out to your local network. Uh, and the way that we do that is by having a, a different uh, IP address for each of these file systems. So you can have up to five file systems per gateway that would amount to uh, up to 320 terabytes of backend uh, file system storage, not including, you know, dedupe data. Um, and, you know, those would be mapped to a single gateway, which can have up to 64 terabytes of local cache. Uh, which would be a shared resource among those file systems. Um, but, you know, oftentimes users, uh, especially of these types of workloads, are only using, um, you know, or accessing anywhere from one to five to, you know, maybe at most 10% of the actual data set. So having a much smaller cache uh, on-prem that's all SSD uh, definitely makes sense. And what we're doing here is uh, spreading out the, the namespace so that you've got uh, the first file system is going to have uh, an IP address one, um, and then the share names thereafter. Uh, and a file system can have virtually unlimited number of shares on that uh, particular file system. Um, and then uh, if you have a second file system attached, that's just going to have a separate IP address um, and on and so forth, all the way down to, to five. Um, the gateway's primary IP address, uh, if you are being conservative and you've only, only got, say, one file system in cloud, um, the gateway's IP address itself, um, you know, what the gateway VM is using on your local network can be the same. You can share that with the, the first file system. Um, but if you are attaching a second file system, you will need to uh, provide a second IP address. Um, and why do we do this? Well, it does solve for uh, the case where separate file systems in cloud can have the same share name. For instance, when you first create a file system, um, they have a default share name of share. So in order to solve for that challenge, uh, we've basically s separated out the namespace um, so that you can actually have uh, the same share name on separate file systems, which you know is not a prerequisite or, or something that the FSX for Windows File Server in cloud actually checks for. All right, so another important concept to think about as you're planning for your migration of your on-prem Windows file shares to the cloud um, is how am I gonna protect my data? And the interesting thing about when I shift the, the central repository, like the source of truth of the data itself to the cloud, um, I'm now only accessing on-prem a, a small subset of the data. I'm not worried about you know doing full backups on a nightly basis or a weekly basis and making sure I've got a second copy off-site. All of my data, you know, my tens to hundreds of potential terabytes of data is already off-site. Um, and we're only dealing with the hot data, the, the new data that's created on-prem and, and shifting that out to the cloud. Um, but since all of that data is out in the cloud already, um, doing backups is you know, certainly important, but it becomes a lot simpler. Uh, so the, the way that we usually recommend to think about it is, okay, I've got a couple of different things that I can do. Um, and the first one is I want a full backup of my data. I want a second copy of it. Um, it's today running in just a, an FSX uh, file file server, so an Amazon FSX file server, which you can do single AZ or multi AZ. That is, um, even in a single AZ, the source repository of this data is uh, two nodes replicating synchronously. So I've always got two copies of the of the data, um, and that could be spread out either in a single availability zone or you could do those two nodes in separate availability zones. What I can then do is set up 
backup plans. And I, I recommend using the AWS backup plans, um, which gives you longer retention uh, requirements as well as things like Vault uh, Lock and, and a number of other options when you use AWS backup as the wrapper around um, the built-in FSX backups. You can schedule these on a, you know, do it once per day or once per hour, um, set up whatever you know, schedule you want with the retention requirements that you want. And that takes a full copy of that data, stores it in S3. Um, if you are using dedupe, um, it will uh, leverage dedupe. So it's block-based uh, backups as well. Um, so I can essentially uh, back up my data, do a full backup once, have a forever incremental, and have a way to do a full restore of my file system, which is great for things like ransomware. I can get a full um, uh, you know, restore of that entire file system up and running uh, rather quickly. For more granular backups, um, there is a second option to, and we'll do a demo of this in a second, um, to talk about uh, previous versions. In previous versions is a native Windows feature. It's It leverages uh, VSS under the covers, and it will actually uh, take snapshots of the underlying file system and allow those snapshots to be accessible on a per file basis so that end users can actually do their own restores. And we'll show this. It doesn't matter if the client is connected to the gateway or if it's connected to the FSX file system in cloud directly. Um, these, these snapshots will become available. And what that allows you to do as the administrator is say, hey, if you're going to be restoring your data um, end users, you've got access to uh, all the restore capabilities that you need. Uh, you can do individual files because I'm taking these snapshots as long as I enable them, um, you know, at least twice a day. And we'll jump over to a demo of this particular feature. Now, the other one I wanted to dive into a little bit here uh, is shadow copies for shared folders. Let's see if hopefully this works. Um, I prepared a little bit of a live demo here because I wanted to show, you know, where do you find information about shadow copies? Why would you use shadow copies in the first place? Um, you know, AWS Backup does integrate with FSX for Windows File Server. So in the back end, the file system itself, um, you can enable backups, which copies all of that data um, from the, the file system or that underlying Windows file server um, to S3. And that's managed, uh, you know, I recommend using the management from AWS backup to manage those uh, recovery points. What that means from a restore perspective is you would need to restore um, the entire file system to be able to pull data out of that file system that you wanted to restore. So, um, you know, in a true failure scenario where you needed to restore, restore the entire file system, that's great because we can restore the entire thing. But if we want to get granular and restore individual files and folders, um, Shadow Copies is a great add-on capability. And it really also helps administrators um, push the burden of doing restores of files and folders to all the way to end users so that it's in the end user's hands, hopefully reducing the amount of uh, tickets that come in. Um, now, some organizations will continue to want to you know, consolidate that and have admins do backups and restores, um, but having uh, an option there for allowing end users to do the restores themselves can reduce that burden quite drastically. And many organizations have adopted that model um, as opposed to you know, having to do the, the restores themselves and limiting the number of tickets that comes into their help desk. Um, so one of the first things I you know, typically recommend doing when you do create an FSX file system is to figure out your data protection strategy. So likely you want a combination of backups. Again, I, I recommend managing that through AWS backup, gives you long-term retention options and, and some other things there. Um, but enabling shadow copies as well. Now, shadow copies are block level uh, backups. So they only uh, chain, they only keep um, and store changed blocks on the underlying file system. So if a file isn't getting modified, you're not gonna be consuming any new storage um, on the underlying file system if you know we take a bunch of snapshots because none of those blocks have changed. Um, so it's, it's pretty intelligent in the way that it works. It's it's optimized for how it consumes storage. It does consume storage on the underlying file system itself. So if I know I have four terabytes of data and I'm storing that on a four terabyte um, file system, I do need to make sure that I add some buffer uh, capacity in there. And you'll see when you when you start to configure uh, shadow copies, one of the first things you do is actually set the default amount of uh, shadow copy storage that you allow um, the file system to use. And by default, it's 
So, um, you know, how, how do I actually manage shadow copies? You know, first and foremost, uh, well, you need to open a uh, remote PowerShell to the file system itself. And when you go into the AWS console, um, there's what's called an FSX remote PowerShell endpoint. And it will look something like this. Labster.local happens to be my, my domain in my lab here. Um, this is just a local VMware environment that uh, the Gateway team has for our lab environment. This does have a, a direct connect back to um, one of the one of the regions, I think, leaves Ohio. So um, we're going to use this FSX file systems remote PowerShell endpoint to connect. I've already connected here, though. If you want to see what that looks like from start to finish, uh, if I come in and go to search and do PowerShell, um, you know, you would you would run this from a Windows machine that's on the domain, and you log in with uh, an administrator that has access. Uh, to run these management commands on the FSX file system, which would be a member of the FSX delegated admins. You would come in, you run this command here, and all of these commands are uh, documented right within the FSX uh, documentation. You'll find, uh, you know, setting the shadow copy schedule, I just copied them uh, for simplicity to my own little notes, um, but they're found in a couple different places. You're administering file systems where you have more of the tasks and then you have the initial setup um, that you can go through uh, with the user guide. So in order to enable them, we're going to open up a uh, session. Now from here, I can do things like set the default amount of shadow copy storage. And if I use the defaults, again, it'll use 10% uh, of the capacity on the file system at the most. Um, you can limit that. You can do custom uh, amounts of storage if you'd like. You can do it by gigabyte or megabyte, or you can do it by uh, percentage. And then you want to set up the actual schedule. And so by default, um, the schedule is 7 a.m. and 12 p.m. UTC time every single day. You can do custom schedules to do it. You know, the, the mindset there is, hey, I want to do it before users get into the office and do it maybe midday throughout the day. Um, so if something does happen, uh, you know, around noontime, uh, wherever my local you know time zone is, then I've got a, a place to restore to. Um, because these are, are snapshots, they're pretty lightweight, so you can actually run them confidently throughout the day. You don't have to worry too much about planning backup windows and, and such. Um, so these two commands I've already done, I've already enabled shadow copies. So let's do a quick uh, figure out what has actually how many uh, shadow copies I've got. And you can see on this particular file system, I've got a whole bunch of them based off of the regular schedule. And as always, you can do uh, something like creating a new shadow copy by simply running this command as well. So you can do on-demand snapshots if you'd like as well. And if we see get, you can see that new one that we just created. It's 4.49 PM uh, UTC time. So um, what does that mean from an end user perspective? Well, end users are simply going to be on their Windows PC of some kind, most likely. Uh, it could be Macs as well, but um, this is needs to be done from a Windows PC. Um, I see a question about the, the billing. Uh, they're, they're billed as they consume space on the file system. So you'd be paying for it as part of the file system storage consumption. Um, <clears throat> so what we're able to do is let's go ahead and come in here. We'll make a change to this file. Um, of course, this file has uh, very important data that we need. Um, let's go ahead and, oops, accidentally delete that data. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And I'm mapped to the file gateway share um, because it is important to know that the previous versions were always available on the file system directly. Um, but I, of course, when we introduce a gateway, it's usually because of latency concerns. So they deploy a gateway closer to the end users. So the end users are actually logging directly into the file gateway, but they'll see the same data that's on the file system, right? Where a gateway, we're presenting out what that file system looks like, allowing users to make end user operations directly on the gateway. So user edits that file. We can then come in, and go and take a look at all of those um, shadow copies that are available. And let's say we restore to one of the ones from earlier. Um, you will see it does take some time for the 
the shadow copies that were done on the, the source file system to populate over. Um, if we do, so that one I just created that was ad hoc may not may not be available just yet, but if we wait a few minutes, um, it'll it'll come. That was ad And actually, this this might be the one. Yeah, ignore some of those timestamps; they may be off. Um, however, let's go ahead and say from our gateway, uh, we're going to go properties, previous versions. We're going to restore. And it is going to overwrite and replace the other file. Go ahead and hit restore. Say OK, OK. And all of a sudden, that very important data that we needed is instantly back. So in a nutshell, um, think of shadow copies as a complement to your regular backup strategy allows end users. This could be, you know, I could be any user on the network. I don't need to have administrative privileges. I can go in and I'll have my files that I have access to, and I'll see the previous versions for all of these files um, as those snapshots are taken on a, on a regular schedule. You as the administrator can edit your, your schedules as you desire. Um, again, by default, it's two times per day. Uh, I believe 7 a.m. And, and 12 p.m. UTC. You may want to edit that for um, your localized times and depending on what when your users come into the office and whatnot. All right, so let's take a moment and discuss some of the, the key differences between our two file gateway types. Um, the original file gateway is our is now rebranded as our Amazon S3 file gateway, and that's um, backed by Amazon S3 object storage. The other one, the new one that we, we've been talking about and that we introduced is the Amazon FSX file gateway. So when we think about our S3 file gateway and the use cases and, and really what it's designed for, um, it's really a, it's a repository for machine generated data, mostly, um, such as backups, archives, uh, customers looking to ingest into their data lakes, uh, things that have maybe post processing workflows where um, there's some sort of long term strategy where, where customers want to access the data in S3 natively through S3 APIs. Um, or other other means. So um, it's really designed for customers that want access natively to those uh, S3 objects. And you know, an S3 file gateway is going to store a file as an object. A file is an object. There's a one-to-one -one translation layer there, and uh, you know, there's no proprietary format that those objects are being stored in. So that data can be accessed directly. Um, the the local cache is really optimized for large file workloads. Uh, such as large database backups, image repositories, et cetera. Um, our S3 file gateway can support up to 10 file shares. And a file share in our S3 file gateway is mapped to a bucket or a prefix within a bucket. Um, and typically we see you know, about 100 active client sessions per gateway. Um, can certainly have more than that, uh, does take you know, additional resources. Um, developed to support all S3 lifecycle policies. This is an important one. Most customers that want to go to S3 know why they want to go to S3, um, and they want to manage how data is um, uh, lifecycled down to, say, archive tiers, such as Glacier Flexible Retrieval or Glacier Deep Archive. Um, so you get a lot of cost savings there, as well as some other features like uh, the S3 data protection capabilities, like versioning and object lock. Um, it also, uh, provides uh, WAN optimization. So with S3 File Gateway, uh, we're doing things like byte range gets, multi-part uploads, um, ways to send large data over the network. So there's some form of WAN optimization. When we're talking about our Amazon FSX File Gateway, uh, typically, you know, I'm thinking about end users, you know, humans accessing these file shares or applications that really need Windows file shares. Uh, so these are multi-user interactive file sharing, such as group shares, home directories, uh, project shares, CAD CAM, you know, a number of different uh, types of use cases. They're designed for, uh, the gateway itself is designed for customers that need a file system underneath, and the file system has certain uh, characteristics, things like rename operations um, that may occur on a regular basis, uh, snapshots, and a number of other things. Um, the local cache itself is, is optimized for both small and mixed file workloads. 
because um, we know that the, the end users are typically using applications such as Microsoft Office and Adobe Suite. Uh, we can support up to five FSx file systems. Uh, you can have an unlimited number of file shares on those file systems. Um, and the, the you know, number of clients we see typically are uh, around 500 active client sessions per gateway. Uh, we've developed it with a high degree of we Windows features parity, um, like we just showed you with uh, shadow copies or previous versions, um, but also things like permissions. Um, a, a Windows file server under the covers can have 64 kilobytes of metadata space to store, you know, these, these long uh, lists of security ACLs that have accumulated on these file servers over, you know, 10 plus years. Um, plus the ability to do application consistent backups, data deduplication, DFS namespace support, um, really just think of a Windows file server and feature parity. Um, it also provides its own level of WAN optimization. So, you know, both of those gateways do work similarly. Um, take a couple seconds here to talk about uh, migrations and especially when you're migrating, you know, on-prem NAS data to AWS, um, we, we always recommend uh, using a tool to migrate the data directly to the cloud like DataSync. Uh, DataSync is optimized for sending only uh, the, the incremental changes as well as, um, you know, leveraging uh, multi-part uploads and parallel processing of files to get those into the cloud. Uh, if you're not familiar with DataSync, uh, you know, you can go right on the, the website and, and find out a little bit more information. But DataSync is a native AWS service, and you simply set a source uh, SMB location, and the destination would be the FSX for Windows File Server in the cloud. Um, and you run an, uh, essentially a, a task uh, that would sync the data. And you can run that task on a schedule so that you can uh, sync that data and keep it in sync up until the final cutover. Um, once the data gets copied with all the metadata into the FSX for Windows file server in the cloud, um, you can then attach that file system to the local gateway uh, and that gateway will serve out all of that data. It'll do a lazy load, so it'll start to pull data in as users start accessing those files. Um, but the idea here is I can preload the cloud with a tool like DataSync uh, and then just simply access the data and the gateway will handle all of the new um, data that comes in once you've cut over all your end users. You get a number of things with a tool like DataSync, like encryption and data integrity verification, um, built-in task scheduling and queuing. Uh, again, only transfers the incremental changes. Uh, and then there's also all the metrics, logs, and, and monitoring that you get as part of uh, you know, any of these tools inside of CloudWatch. Uh, so what does this really get you? You know, can free up that space on your expensive on-prem storage, um, access archive data on-premises using File Gateway for FSx for Windows. Um, and we do support um, all of the security ACLs as well as the system ACLs. Pricing for our FSX file gateway uh, is simple. It's uh, a fixed hourly fee, 69 cents per hour per gateway. Uh, you're not paying any ingest fees into, you know, as you're in ingesting new data into AWS. Um, there's no capacity fees from the gateway's perspective. Um, the, the storage itself and the capacity and the throughput that you set on your FSX for Windows file server in the cloud, um, you do get billed uh, for FSX for Windows, the standard rates. Um, the pricing does vary by region, um, but the data transfer out, um, you would get charged as well. But the, the key with the gateway is that we're serving 80 to 90% of the data uh, read requests. So you should be pulling out minimal amounts of data. If you'd like, uh, there's a number of resources. I always recommend to go to the uh, FS, the, the main product pages of, of these services. And that's a lot of great info up there, videos, uh, customer testimonials, et cetera. Um, so the Amazon FSx for Windows File Server product page would be important in this case, the FSx File Gateway uh, product page. Um, we've got a number of blogs out there, the AWS Storage blog. And we do have a workshop if you'd like to get your hands dirty and uh, work on that same um, uh, type of, of setup that I did in the performance demo today, uh, you can go ahead and, and we do have a GitHub 
uh, link that is customer visible. So you can go and uh, get an environment spun up where you've got a, a local FSX file system and you've got a remote client in another region and a gateway stood up in another region to simulate uh, being uh, hundreds of milliseconds away uh, from one region to another and getting the performance benefit of the local gateway. Thank you. Now we'll open it up to uh, live Q&A.